In this discussion, we are going to cover the transition from early modern to modern Southeast Asia. You'll be looking at especially the area on the right hand side of the map of the left hand side of the slide with Majapahit, Lumpuri, Angor, and Champa on that particular map. But you might notice Vijayanagara Empire and also the Delhi Sultanate on that map and how that right hand side Southeast Asia transitions to colonial Southeast Asia, pictured on the right hand side of the map with the Dutch East Indies in what is today Indonesia, British Malaya in what is today Malaysia, and also the United States Philippines, the Philippines being once part of the US until the Commonwealth period from 1935 to 1945 and then independence. Of course, on the mainland there, you have French Indochina in green, and then the British Raj extending through British Burma, what is today Myanmar, up there in red. Now, as you may recall, we've touched upon three critical classical empires of Southeast Asia. Champa, which emerges in the 2nd through 4th century and then coalesces as a kingdom by the 7th century and expands into empire status by right around the 8th, 9th, 10th century or so, with independent kingdoms sort of rising and falling over time. And then the last kingdom, Panturanga, lasting from the 17th through the 19th century. But really, by the 17th century, we're no longer talking about a classical empire, but an early modern kingdom. So Champa as an empire really um, tends to end by the 17th century. In the case of Angkor, we have the empire again rising by the 9th century and then um, being defeated by an invasion by Ayutthaya in the 15th century. In the case of Majapahit in maritime Southeast Asia, you have Majapahit bringing together those various maritime island kingdoms by the 13th century and then rising to a peak and then declining by the 16th century. We're also going to cover here three early modern state forms, especially 16th to 19th century, the transition from the Nwitten lords to the empire of Dai Nam, or the Empire of Nguyen Vietnam. During the same period, roughly from the 15th through the 19th centuries, over there on the map in Siem La, you have uh, just south of Siem La, rather, in what is labeled as Tran Thai Than, as part of the Nguyen Empire. You also have actually much of this being independent from the 15th through the 19th centuries. This is sort of an imaginary map from the Vietnamese perspective, but those are sort of rising and falling Cambodian kingdoms. Then over an island, Southeast Asia and Peninsular Malaya, you have the Malay and Achenese sultanates, which rise and fall from the 15th through the 20th century with Malay nobles from the sultanates being pictured in the background of the slide there. By the time of the modern period, you have Dutch Indonesia or the Dutch East Indies, roughly from 1800 to 1945, at which point Indonesia proclaims independence, um, portrayed in the Dutch East Indies down on the bottom left and side of the slide there. The Japanese Empire, of course, is influential in Southeast Asia, but French Indochina is quite prominent. You might have run into French Indochina in discussions in world history class or in French history class. Uh, French Indochina is formally established in 1887 and lasts until 1945, although the French Empire and French government doesn't give up their grip on Indochina formally until 1954. The Japanese Empire nonetheless plays a role in the loosening of the grips of both the Dutch East Indies and French Indochina on Southeast Asia. With the Japanese invasion in 1942 and the rhetoric of Pan-Asianism, independence movements are beginning to rise in Southeast Asia and independence movements will become prominent across the region from the 1930s through the 1940s, beginning really in the 1920s. Independence movements will 
as the Japanese retreat also take up the arms from Japanese and proclaim almost in a single swoop the Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam independent all in the same year in 1945. Now in this class we've already covered the Champa Empire, the Champa civilization, a little bit as a collection of independent polities that gradually coalesce into a collection of kingdoms in what is today Vietnam, and with the last kingdom, Pantaranga, being formally annexed by the Nguyen Empire in 1832. Gradually, the Hindu-oriented elements and the Islamic-oriented elements of the Champa civilization align themselves with religious communities known as Cham Ahyan, referring to the Hindu local forms, and Cham Ahwan, referring to the Islamic local forms. This becomes a sort of syncretic Cham religion, kind of paralleling Sikhism, not the same at all, quite different than Sikhism, but kind of paralleling Sikhism in that there's blending of Hindu and Muslim influences into a single religious context. We've also previously discussed Angkor, the Angkoran Empire, and centered on Yashodapura as the ancient capital of Angkor. Hinduism was, of course, prominent throughout Champa and Angkor up to the period of the influence of uh, Islam in the case of Pandranga from the 17th century onwards, and then especially Buddhism in Angkor, Cambodia, or Angkor Wat from roughly the 13th century onwards, you start to see this major influence of Buddhism changing the landscape. But that being said, you do have this um, <coughs> Siamese attack of Angkor in 1431, where Ayutthaya sacks Angkor. Historical Angkor was far more than a site for religious art and architecture, however, it included vast cities and a vast empire. Of course, several religious movements contributed to the historical development of Angkor, including especially Shaivism, and those movements centered on the worship of uh, the Shaiva Linga. A royal cult of personality also identifying with the king uh, sort of identifying the king as a personification of a deity upon earth made this Shaivism somewhat similar to that of Champa and then also the pre Majapahit Malay kingdoms in island Southeast Asia. But there was also Vaishnavism, which was prominent in Angkor as well, and then Buddhism at first in the Mahayana form and then later in the Theravada form. The temple pictured on the bottom right hand side of the slide there is a temple that is dedicated to Rajendra Varman at uh, 948 of the Common Era, so roughly 9th, 10th century. You're talking about sort of construction here. It's named Paksai Chamkrong in Cambodian, but it's a temple you can sort of see the pyramid structure, but on top is clearly a house of Shiva. So mirroring, in a sense, or paralleling, in a sense, similar temple constructions in both South and Southeast Asia. Turning now to island Southeast Asia, the empire of Majapahit was a Javanese Hindu empire in Southeast Asia that was based on the island of Java. It existed from 1293 to right around 1527 and reaching its peak of glory during the era of Hayam Wuruk, whose reign from 1350 to 1389 was marked by conquests that extended throughout Southeast Asia. His achievement is also accredited to his prime minister, Gajamada. So here you have a sort of parallel to some South Asian forms where the sort of prime minister of the empire becomes quite important. Now, according to a local historical cum religious source, the Nagara Kretagama, which was composed by Deshavarnyana, which is written in 1365, Majapahit is actually an empire of 98 
various tributary polities stretching from the island of Sumatra to New Guinea, consisting of present-day Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, through southern Thailand, also East Timor, the southwestern Philippines, in particular the Sulu archipelago, and, that being said, the scope of Majapahit's sphere of influence is still subject to substantial debate among historians. Majapahit was also one of the last major Hindu empires of the region and considered to be one of the greatest and most powerful maritime empires in the entire history of Southeast Asia. It is sometimes seen as a precedent for the modern nationalist Indonesian nationalist movement's sense of territoriality. However, its influence extended beyond the modern territory of Indonesia, and this has been um, proven by several archaeological studies as well as historical assessments. Now, the, Ingman, the image that you see here on the bottom left is Aditya Varman, a senior minister of Majapahit, but if you look closely at the image, you'll notice the skulls at the bottom, and it's actually Aditya Varman depicted as Bhairava. So it's a uh, religious image of Bhairava, that sort of that sort of hot, um, that rageful manifestation of Shaiva in tantric Shaivism, but also merged with this historical figure Aditya Varman, who's also said to have established a separate kingdom of Pagaruyung in central Sumatra. The 16th century um, report of the reign of Aditya Varman suggests that the royal power had been split among three recognized reigning kings that ruled over different aspects of the kingdom. So there was the king of the social world, Raja Alam. Then there was the king of the sort of traditional sphere of practice called the king of Adat or Raja Adat. And then there was the king of religion called Raja Ibadat. So this is sort of the, the king of Islam, the, the individual who's responsible for the Islamic sphere, the individual who's responsible for the sphere of traditional practices, including Hinduism, and then also the king responsible presumably for trade. Collectively together, these three kings were known as the Rajo Tiko Selo. So um, three being sort of a representation that might be taken from the three Murti here. The capital of this particular state is reconstructed in modern Sumatra and portrayed on the top left side of the slide here, or in the top left image of the slide here. And you might note that it does not look like a Hindu temple. It looks rather East Asian in construction, in a sense, but actually, if you look more closely at it, it resembles a boat, and it's actually very island Southeast Asian in terms of its architectural style. Now we turn now to early modern state forms in Southeast Asia, beginning with the Nguyen Dynasty, which was the last Vietnamese dynasty that ruled the entirety of what is now Vietnam independently from 1802 to 1883. Relatively short period of time for an empire, but actually the Nguyen lords stretch back in their prominence in Vietnamese society through the 16th century. During its existence, the empire expanded into modern-day southern Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos through a continuation of centuries-long um, sort of movements and progressions of Vietnamese people, conquests, and so forth. Um, and the Nguyen Vietnamese Empire understood this in a sort of propagandistic fashion, which they called Nam Tien, being the progression to the south. Now, what's important here is to understand that this is not the actual history, but the way that the Nguyen Empire understood history was this constant progression southward. That being said, there were numerous Siamese, being Thai, and Vietnamese wars throughout the 19th century. After 1883, the Nguyen Empire ruled nominally as the head of a French protectorate of Annam and also Tonkin until the final months of World War II when they 
later nominally ruled over the Empire of Vietnam until the Japanese surrender. The Winton family established a somewhat feudal system, not exactly a feudal system, but a somewhat feudal system over vast amounts of territory as the Winton lords beginning as early as the 16th century before going on to defeat the Taishun dynasty during the Taishun Wars, establishing their own imperial rule by the 19th century. However, dynastic rule only began with the reign of Xialong, ascending to the throne in 1802 and ending the previous contested rule period. During the same time, roughly, the post-Angkor period of Cambodian history, often known as the Middle Period of Cambodian history, from the 15th century through 1863, reliable sources, particularly from the 15th and 16th century, remain relatively rare, an important caveat. Nonetheless, a conclusive explanation that relates to the concrete events manifesting in the decline of the Cambodian Empire during the 15th century has really not been yet produced. However, most contemporary historians consent that several distinct and gradual changes of religious, dynastic, and administrative nature, environmental problems, and ecological imbalance led to a shifting of the power centers further southward toward the Mekong Delta region. In recent years, focus has notably shifted towards an understanding of climate changes that occurred during the early modern period. Epigraphy in temples ends in the third decade of the 14th and does not resume until the mid 16th century. Recording of the royal chronology discontinues with King Jayavarman the Ninth, or Jayavarman the Ninth Par Parameshavara, and there exists not a single contemporary record with a king's name for about 200 years until this Pong Savada tradition begins to pick up again during the early modern period. The Pong Savada, nonetheless, do record quite a lot about the early modern period in Cambodian history and include records of the capitals of Long Vec, which is pictured here in the top left from a Dutch source, and also the capital of Udong on the mountain, pictured in the bottom right there at the top of the mountain of Phnom Udong. This is actually relatively close to the contemporary capital of Phnom Penh. So you have this shifting centers of power in Cambodia and the increase in the power of Theravada Buddhism during that particular time, leading to the decrease of the power of Hinduism in Cambodian society. During the same period, you also have a relatively prosperous series of Malay sultanates that rise to power in island Southeast Asia, beginning especially with the Sultanate of Malacca, which actually goes all the way back to the 14th century in the earliest records, but then continuing even after the Portuguese conquest and then the later Dutch conquest of where Malacca once stood, you still have these series of sultanates that are proclaiming connections to Malacca, perhaps with exception, some exception being the Achenese Sultanate. The Malacca Sultanate was a Malay Sultanate centered in modern day Malacca, Malaysia. Conventional historical thesis mark about 1400 as the sort of founding of the Sultanate. The Sultanate's power, however, grows through the 15th century. And the Sultanate of Perak is one of the oldest hereditary seats among Malay states. There's actually still a Sultan of Perak in Malaysia. So um, while Malaysia is a uh, sort of parliamentary republic, there's still this nominally re religious come uh, royal power with the sultanates and those hereditary positions. The Sultanate of Perak claims to be a sort of lineary descent of the Sultanate of Malacca as well. Furthermore, um, this is also the case with the Sultanate of Johar or Johor. Now, the Sultanate of Acha, officially known as the uh, Karachuan Acha, or the Kingdom of Acha, 
was a sultanate centered in the modern-day Indonesian province of Aceh that was a major regional power from the 16th through the 17th centuries before experiencing a long period of gradual decline and eventual incorporation into the Dutch East Indies. Nonetheless, you do have members of these various sultanates pictured here. So on the bottom left here, this is Raja Yusuf of Perak. And then on the top right here, this is a Sultan of Acha. Now we're going to close here with a focus on three modern empires in Southeast Asia, beginning with the Dutch East Indies, which was a Dutch colony of what is today Indonesia. It was formed from the nationalized colonies of the Vernekti Gustindic Company or the Dutch East Indy Company, which came under the administration of the central government in 1800. During the 19th century, Dutch possessions and hegemony were expanded and, of course, reaching their greatest territorial extent in the early 20th century, the Dutch East Indies finally did conquer that Sultanate of Aceh. During the Dutch period, colonial rule, the cash crops, especially tobacco and spice, became the commodities of the Dutch colonies, making the Dutch colonies in East India or the Dutch East Indies one of the most valuable colonies under European rule in the world. This would also set the stage later for the wealth of Dutch oil companies. The colonial social order was based on rigid racial and class hierarchies with the Dutch elite at the top, but sometimes linked to indigenous subjects through marriage, unequal marriages on occasion. The term Indonesia came into use for the geographical location after right around 1880. And in the early 20th century, local intellectuals began developing the concept of Indonesia as a nation state setting the stage for an independence movement. Of course, with Japan's World War II occupation dismantling much of the colonial infrastructure and state economies and rule over Southeast Asia, following the Japanese surrender in August 1945, Indonesian nationalists declared independence, which they fought for subsequently during the Indonesian National Revolution. Independence was recognized in 1949, and the last holdout of Netherlands New Guinea or Western New Guinea was added to Indonesia 14 years later in 1963 under the provisions of the New York Agreement. Now, another colony, Indochine Francaise, or in Vietnamese, Dom Yong Tho Phap, uh, just French Indochina, if you prefer, was officially known as the Indochinese Union during a period from 1887 onward and the Indo-Chinese Federation after 1947 as a regrouping of French colonial territories in Southeast Asia until its demise in 1954. That being said, of course, locals proclaimed independence in 1945 and were very much independent from 1945 onward the french government french colonial government just refused to recognize this for nine years continuing the bloody battle over the indo-chinese peninsula for that nine-year period in an uh, absolutely desperate but clearly definitively defeated campaign this was finally ended in Dien Bien Phu, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Now, French Indochina had comprised three Vietnamese regions of Tonkin in the north, as well as Annam in the center and Cochin China in the south. The capitals, however, were ever shifting. So at first you have the capital for um, much of its history being Hanoi, roughly 1902 to 1945. But Saigon had been the capital from 1887 to 1902, and then again from 1945 to 1954, with a brief interlude with the capital at Dalat. So, with this in mind, the rotating capitals was an attempt, a failed attempt, to keep them 
secured to keep the capital secure. However, war in Burma, India, Thailand, the Philippines, Indochina, Malaya, and Singapore was brought on by the Japanese imperial invasion as the Japanese Empire attacked British and American territories as well as French territories with a near simultaneous series of offensive against different positions in Southeast Asia from December 7th and 8th in 1941. Action in this theater ended when the Japanese Empire announced an intent to surrender on August 15th of 1945, with the formal surrender of Japan or the Japanese Empire taking place on September 2nd of 1945. So now you have a general outlay of the modern empires in Southeast Asia and the early empires, the early classical empires in Southeast Asia, and the early modern empires in Southeast Asia, the question becomes, how would this changing history shape local Hindu communities during the period in question? Go ahead and make a quick post. And let's get the discussion going.